Hello here. Welcome to This Is Your Life. Tonight, a very special occasion, although my surroundings may not suggest it. I'm in a dressing room at the Palais Theatre St Kilda in Melbourne, waiting to surprise a great, perhaps Australia's greatest, international star. At this moment, she is on stage taking her curtain calls before a capacity audience. Dame Joan, good evening. My name is Roger Clemson. Oh. At this moment, we are on national television. Oh, Dame Joan Sutherland, doing? this is your oh. life. It's three years now and I still miss Bob terribly. Oh, I get my moody bits, but I'm not unhappy. The girls are great company. I'll always be grateful Bob believed in his insurance, AMP. I had to sell the big house, but I don't have to work full time. And the two days I do, I enjoy. And I bought this beach place. A little crazy somehow. Bob always said he'd like us to live by the beach. For all insurance help and advice, talk to an AMP representative. They got him up in Rocky, got him out at Burke, got him up in Darwin, you want to see him work. They come flying out from Moe, a phone call to the bloke, he's in his truck and moving for a measure and a quote. What makes more Australians get behind B&D Roller Door? The center lift lock, the Nilo felt running strip, the range of color bond, timber bond and marby plate finishes, or the solid steel security? Locking up in Perth, rolling down in Adelaide, they've all got central or what about B&D controller door? Press the button and drive right in. In the dark or in a downpour or any time at all. Like early down in Cuba, Cyril and his son have made their reputation on Australia's number one. Australia's number one. I wonder, would you like to sit down? Thank you very much, Mr. Clemson, I would. Thank you. Joan, this we know is the year of your silver wedding anniversary. Oh, and we know that you, you know would like... Don't you? We know that you'd like to share this occasion with the person closest to you, your husband, mentor and maestro, Richard Bonney. <laughs> Joan, you were born in November 1926 in Sydney, the daughter of Muriel Alston and William Sutherland, a master tailor from Scotland. The family lives at Point Piper on Sydney Harbour where you love to swim. Your father dies when you're only six, it's the height of the depression and the family is forced to split up. You go to live with your sister and your mother. Your education is at St. Catherine's Waverley, and in the audience are three of your school friends that you haven't seen for nearly 40 years. Barbara Hunt, Rona Taylor, and Peggy Gospel. Whereabouts oh, are you? Oh, right there. <laughs> Joan, you have dreams of becoming a singer, but first you complete a secretarial course. Then she got a job and learned all about rabbit traps and combine harvesters. A good friend since those early years, singer Elizabeth Allen. <laughs> Elizabeth, uh, we know that uh, rabbit traps were very important to the company that Joan was working for, but uh, not much use to her singing career. How did she come to start that? Well, we, we were students at the same time. Uh, we were uh, working girls, you reminded me once, since we were 16. <laughs> <laughs> and we had lessons in the lunch hour. We rushed everywhere. If you're back late, you got docked. That's right. Remember? Yes. Not so that, much docked as lo lost your Saturday morning off. Dreadful One things. One per month. 
dreadful things used to happen. We worked hard, but it was great fun. We tried hard. I can remember queuing for cheap tickets to go to the Italian opera season. Yes, yeah, so if I couldn't gallery. go, you did. Um, That's if right. You, you queued. <laughs> I, I did the queuing for us both, and it was great time. They were a marvellous experience. We sang at music clubs. We were in competitions. We tried everything. Yes. We definitely tried everything, and they, they were marvellous days. Well, if Elizabeth Allen, thank you for being with us. <laughs> Jared, your mother's beautiful mezzo-soprano voice influences you from childhood. You sit beside her, imitating the sounds and the way that she breathes. Richard, was that the beginning of the singer we know today? Oh, certainly it was. I mean, the, the beginning was that she's born with great vocal cords. The next most important thing is that she had inside what it takes. Uh, her mother helped her immensely because she had in front of her a, a real example of bel canto all her childhood. Her mother had a phenomenal voice. She... Now, Joan, your Uncle John, an opera buff, thrills you with the stories of the great singers and brings home their recordings, including Australia's own Dame Nellie Melba. Well, the man who accompanied Melba and taught Richard and who has followed your career right up to today, known to all Australia as the ABC's Mr. Melody Man, is in our audience tonight, Lindley Evans. <laughs> Joan, you start entering competitions in 1947, winning the Sun Aria in Sydney in 1949, and in 1950, you take first prize in the Mobile Quest in Melbourne. And I won nothing except some advice from Joan. <laughs> Your friend, colleague, and fellow Mobile Quest competitor, Margretta Elkins of the Australian Opera. <laughs> Margaret, will you tell us what was the advice you received from Joan? Well, I was very young and I had just become engaged to be married and Joan said to me, don't get married. She said, uh, <laughs> if, if you want to sing, don't get married. She said, uh, you don't need a husband. <laughs> uh, so, and that was, so then in a couple of years' time when I went to England and I met Joan in the tube, in the train, in the tube, and she said, uh, I looked at her and she had this man beside her. She said, this is my husband. I said, oh. And she said, I also have a child. I said, oh. This is the person that told me not to get married. So much for advice. Yes. Margaret, thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you. <laughs> Joan, the Mobile Quest launches many young Australian singers on professional careers. Your prize money, together with a matched £1,000 from Uncle John, enables you to plan, study in London and dream of Covent Garden Opera. There's a person who has followed your career ever since in a most remarkable way, and here she is, Sister Marie Bernard. Sister Marie, oh. the costumes of the characters Joan plays are truly magnificent and world famous, and you've made perfect miniatures of them with dolls. I understand that you're actually making a set for Joan. Yes, I have done 60, and Joan, here are the first three today. Oh. <laughs> Thank you very much. Sister Thank Marie, you. Sister Marie, thank you. <laughs> well, Joan, you're all set to leave Sydney. Oh. Your mother accompanies you and you begin the great adventure. The ship, the Maloya, passes the site that one day will become the Sydney Opera House. And what happens next in your journey to the stages of world opera, we shall see in just a moment. Thirty years ago, a group of young men began a plan to protect their families, and their families' families, and their families. Down through the generations, it grew stronger and stronger. A society owned by its members, investing in Australia and protecting Australians. AMP, a foolproof idea that today protects over one million Australians and their families. AMP, share it. Ha, ha, ha. 
heart Louis, you've been with us a long, long time The Australian family's favorite We know craft flavors fine Craft cheddar cheese with bodybuilding calcium, phosphorus and protein It's nice to know that some of the good things never change Hello there Craft Louis, we know craft cheddar's fine Sunny set for fame Sunny, so shining bright you really earn your name Oh, big bills are gone, fuel savings come My sunny drive and you is fun Let sunny car so new shine for you You came imported here to me You're the car to set me free Let sunny car so new shine for you New Datsun Sunny, shining for you at your Datsun dealer when you arrive in England in 1951, Richard is already there, and together you share London's concerts, theatres and art galleries. At opera school, you share your aspirations with other talented young hopefuls. You move into a bed-sitter and buy a piano. Richard becomes a regular visitor and soon begins to work with you, developing and changing your voice. Is it true, Richard, that uh, that involved a little uh, pretense? A little pretense, yes. Uh, I used to play Aries for about a third or a fourth higher than they should have been in order to get her up into the stratosphere. Well, she as well was... as the pretense, there was a lot of browbeating too. Uh, was there? <laughs> well, Joan, you auditioned for Covent Garden three times. And That's finally right. in 1952, oh. win a place in that famous company at ten pounds a week. That's right. In 1954, you and Richard are married, beginning a personal and professional career that one day will be recognised the world over. But first, you must gain experience in singing and acting. Joan, do you remember the dustbins in that dingy passageway in Paddington Street at 3 o'clock on the 13th of February, 1953? The celebrated English theatre and opera producer whom we've flown to be with you tonight, Norman Ayrton. <laughs> Norman, Norman, you produced nine of Joan's operas, as well as uh, coaching her as an actress. Mm -hmm. What can you tell us about the actress and the person? Well, she didn't always like the things I asked her to do. I never she liked hated... the things anybody asked me to do. <laughs> <laughs> she hated things which weren't related to dramatic situations. Do you remember the time I actually stormed out of the house and swore I'd yes. never worked with you again? <laughs> one, of the things I'd, one of the things I love and admire about Joan is her marvellous sense of the ridiculous and her ability to explode the tension in the atmosphere of a rehearsal, I mean, just when everybody's getting to screaming pitch, yeah. which is a great gift. Uh, I remember once in Melbourne, uh, when we were here rehearsing Semiramide in 1965, uh, and we were under tremendous pressure, and we were just working on the last scene, and Joan had just been stabbed by her son, played by Monica Sinclair, and was lying on the floor. And we were working very fast, and I said to Monica and Doris Yarrick, now you, in the last few bars, you hold out your hands and you move towards each other, uh, and on the last bar, the high priest clasps your hands in marriage, and a voice at my feet said, over my dead father. <laughs> That's a lovely story. Norman, thank you very much for being with us. <laughs> Going after nearly eight years of learning your craft and struggling for recognition, Covent Garden decides you are ready to sing the title role in a new production of Lucia de Lammermoor. It is a tremendous challenge. The great Maria Callas, who has made this role her own, attends your dress rehearsal and is photographed with you. In fact, that opera is the brink of fame for two great talents. Speaking to you from Los Angeles, the famous Italian stage and film director who directed you in Lucia, Franco Zeffirelli. Oh. Remember the first time we met with dear old Seraphine? Uh, we were both so embarrassed and so shy and I uh, touched <laughs> Not you. Not for long, darling. Put a hand on your shoulder and just shrunk away. And I said, John, I'm sorry, but I'm Italian. I have to communicate with my hands because my English is not that good and also because I want to feel, feel the people I'm uh, associating my life and my work with. So please, let me embrace you. And I embraced you and you blushed like a little girl. And my God, you've gone a long way since you haven't blushed anymore. <laughs> Except for pleasure when you had these tremendous triumphs, one after the other. Very, very well deserved. What about yourself? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, 
Joan, after Lucia, you're in demand in all the great opera houses of the world. You begin to record exclusively for London and Decca and make Switzerland your international base. But the triumph is sometimes set against a background of pain. She's not only one of the great singers of the century, but Joan has guts. Oh. Executive Vice President of London Records in the United States, whom we've flown from New York to be with you tonight, oh. Mr. Terry oh. McEwen. Oh. <laughs> Terry, you've known Joan from the early days in London. Yes, uh, Rick introduced me to Joan shortly after her arrival in, in London, the girl he had been raving about. And so I was very lucky to be there for her debut at Covent Garden and for all the dramatic soprano parts that she sang there at the beginning of her career. And the fantastic thing about that girl, apart from her voice, was her courage. Because, you know, Joan suffered a great deal from various physical problems during her early years her sinuses, particularly in her teeth. I remember one day she spent the whole afternoon, and it must have been hell, in the dentist chair, got directly on the underground train, went to Covent Garden, and walked on a Zaida. And that takes a heck of a lot of guts. <laughs> and in regard to records, my dear, the uh, EMI Company of Australia, which distributes our Decca records here and yours, has asked me to present you with a platinum record to commemorate all the wonderful record sales that you've accomplished here in Australia, oh, and like you have all over really? the world. Heaven <laughs> Joan, one after the other, you conquer the audiences of the five major opera houses of the world. Covent Garden, La Scala Milan, the Paris Opera, the Vienna State Opera, the Met in New York. Richard begins to conduct for you and soon all your performances will be under his baton. A fine American singer who often shares your limelight is Marilyn Horne, and here you are together in concert in 1965 with Richard conducting. I remember very much the night we both made our debuts in New York. We were sitting backstage, ready to go on. Um, I was nervous. Um, I'm, I don't know about you, but I'm sure you were. And uh, you very calmly told me that your mother had died that morning. And I looked at you, gracious lady, sitting there, going on stage, doing the thing that your mother had always wished and wanted for you. I, of course, too, have had my tragedies. And that moment has served as a great inspiration for me at all times. But Joan, further ill health is ahead. Severe back problems cause you to cancel a concert tour of Australia on doctor's orders. However, finally, after too many years away, you do return home. Joan, it was my late husband's greatest ambition. One of the judges for your winning Mobile Quest performance in 1950, Lady Viola Aww. Tate. <laughs> Lady Tate, of course you were referring to the Sutherland Williamson opera season of 1965 as your husband's great ambition, weren't you? Yes, of course I was. And it was an absolute magnificent triumph for you, Joan. And for you too, Richard, because you assembled that magnificent company. It was also a glorious climax to Frank's career at the end. Will you tell us, Lady Tate, about the closing night of that tour in Melbourne? Well... All of a sudden, in the audience, a man's voice said, Joan, sing Home Sweet Home. And everybody wondered whether she was going to do it or not. And she did. Norman Ayrton pushed the piano on the stage, and Richard sat down, and she sang Home Sweet Home better than Melba ever did. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. Joan, it'll be a further nine years before you come home again. 
The Sydney Opera House has finally opened, and what a homecoming it is. The magnificent Tales of Hoffman, in which you play all the four leading roles. And now you become a regular visitor with operas like Lacme. his permanent golf mate and his AMP man. Our wives played too, but Harve's wife Meg died two years ago. When their first child was born, I suggested to Harvey the important person to protect was Meg, and he did. That AMP policy now pays for most of Mrs Murray, their live-in housekeeper. Harvey's life isn't the same, but it's not all bad. For all insurance help and advice, talk to an AMP representative. The action on news, the action on fashion, the action on TV programs. Whatever you need to know, you'll find all the action in Sydney's Sun. Welcome all Sydney Sun is where the action is. Where the action is. These room water heaters are winners. That's why I joined the room team. We got room heat. We got steam heat. We got. Talk to Prospect County Council now about the room team of indoor or outdoor models. There's a room system that's right for your home, and Prospect County Council will arrange complete installation on easy terms. Everybody come and help themselves. For my guests, I insist on the best. And look what John West has now. <laughs> Succulent hams. And something really different. Prime corn silverside. Juicy, like you'd cooked it yourself. Just a few minutes in boiling water, and you can serve it hot with vegetables. Trust John West to come up with another first. Prime corn silverside. It's John West. Insist on it. We have right now here part of your recent sensational New York concert with Pavarotti. <laughs> Cat. 13 years after, you remember when we were there together in Australia to have the tour with you and Ricky and all the company, what an incredible experience was for all of us, I think. And when I was with my hand exploring your diaphragm, of course <laughs> trying to learn how to support my voice. You never give up, and I you? did learn very quick in four months of tour. And I am here now to greet you and all your friend who are around you. I want to give you a big, enormous kiss from my bottom of the heart. <laughs> from the heart, my bottom. I know I mean from the bottom of my heart. <laughs> Joan, you and Richard jealously guard your private lives, keeping your home and family out of the spotlight. Back in 1956, your son Adam is born in London and you spend as much time with him as you can in spite of the pressures of your careers. Growing up with opera isn't as easy as it sounds. On holiday in Australia from his hotel management career in Switzerland, your son Adam Bonney. Oh. With such parents, isn't it uh, rather surprising that you didn't go in for a musical career as well? I think two in the family was enough. <laughs> <laughs> and to match their success would be pretty difficult. Adam, won't you join your parents? Thank you.
Joan, you and Richard are a spectacular partnership. How would you sum it up? I don't think it's a, think of it as a partnership. I think of it as just one. It's it's merged together somehow. It's it's not even a partnership anymore. I think it's just one. I, I think we're we're sort of one person. What would you say, Richard? Well, I would never have wanted anything different in in life. We've had everything we ever dreamt about. Joan, we have saved one special surprise. You are a hoot. Do you think I'll sing any better if they make me a dame? Someone you know very well. He wrote your biography. We've flown in from London to be with you tonight. Distinguished Australian author, Russell Braddock. Oh. Russell. Your book about Joan Sutherland documents her life from childhood to stardom. You know her as a personal friend. Tell us about the Joan you know. Well, I first met Joan in 1960 when she'd had a stupendous success. Indeed, the, the Italians were calling you La Stupenda. And at the same time, she was a very modest and unassuming lady. And she's had lots of stupendous successes ever since. And she's still a modest and unassuming lady. As well as that, I remember a pretty dotty sense of humor. And now, of course, she is a dame. Yes, she is. It's a strange thing. I think all countries need their great artists, and all countries, if they've got any sense at all when they acquire them, as Australia has Joan, should do something about it. They should let everybody in the world know that this is not just a Mr. or a Miss or a Mrs. But Australia just went on giving her initials, and so did Britain. So I went and saw the High Commissioner in London, and I complained bitterly about this. I said, why isn't this marvellous singer a dame? And he promised me he'd do something about it. And then I thought, well, I'd better tell her because she's big and she can kill me. So I wrote to her and told her what I'd done. And Joan, you wrote back and said, you are a hoot. Do you think I'd sing any better if they made me a dame? I don't think they'd sing any better, you'd sing any better if they made you a duchess, but I'm delighted, along with about 80 million others, that they have made you a dame. It's marvellous. Thank you, Russell. I think it's marvellous too. Dame Joan Sutherland, this is your life. Thank you. recorded at the Palais Ballroom, St Kilda. Our guest stay at the Boulevard Hotel and we're in Melbourne at the St Kilda Road Travel Lodge. Bringing the students together like this is part of TAA's Friendly Way service. This Is Your Life was presented by the AMP Society.